Uh, hello everyone, my name is Grace Mary and I'm a recent graduate from the University of Cambridge with a postgraduate degree in law. Um, by way of introduction, I'll just tell you a bit about my educational background. Uh, for my A-levels, I studied English literature, history and geography and I achieved two A-stars and an A. And then I went on to study my undergraduate law degree at the London School of Economics or the LSE. And that was a three year program and you do a mix of both core and optional modules. So the core modules, for example, would include criminal, public law, contract law, tort. And then there's over sort of 30 optional modules you can choose from. Uh, so you can really choose what area interests you and, and specialize on that. Uh, and then obviously I went to Cambridge after that. Um, why did I decide to study law? I think there were two key reasons. The first was that I thought they'd be a good match for my A-levels and the skills that I could get from my A-level subjects. So is anybody here studying any essay based subjects, English literature, history, for example, anything like that? Just raise your hand or. Um, um, I'm doing history as one of mine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think there's a lot of sort of transferable skills. So if you're reading sources, you have an analytical mind and you can use that when you're looking at cases and statutes. Um, it's a really sort of challenging area, but, but also law is quite a, an open profession. So I knew a student who was studying biology and maths as well, and, and they loved their law degree. So it, it's definitely an, an open field. And the second reason was that I participated in an outreach program, which was called Pathways to Law. And I'd attended lectures about law and I'd networked with barristers and solicitors. So it gave me a bit of an insight into the field. And um, most universities have outreach programs or taster sessions. So if you'd like any more information on that, then please ask me at the end of the presentation. Uh, in relation to whether the course lived up to my expectations, uh, definitely, it was a very challenging but exciting three years. Um, it's a difficult course, but if you find the area in law that you enjoy, it's, it's gonna be really enjoyable. Um, e even areas that you think you won't enjoy. I thought I would hate land law before starting, but it was really interesting once you get into it. It's really practical. It lends itself well to a career, both a legal career in practice, but also non-legal careers. I think a law degree is, is quite sought after by many professions and they recognize the skills that you get during your three years. Uh, and finally, for a while I was torn between English and law, but someone gave me a really good piece of advice. And they said that if you enjoy English, you'll always be able to sort of read books on your own and, and get into English on your own. But I don't think you can do that uh, with law. So it's a great opportunity and one that shouldn't be passed up. And that's it by way of introduction. So what is constitutional law? Constitutional law, otherwise known as public law, as I said uh, before, it's one of the core modules that you'll have to study for your undergraduate degree. And I would say there's three key elements to constitutional law. One, it looks at sort of the text, the constitution, the document that sets out the relationship between the citizens and the state and between the different branches. As you can see from the diagram there, there's three branches. Legislative, so you'll be looking at things like Congress or Parliament, depending on which country you're from. Um, the executive branch, so presidents, prime ministers, and the judicial branch, so, so the courts. And then we'll be sort of looking at key case studies to highlight the issues that we talk about. The, the third picture you should see there is um, Lady Hale, the Supreme Court. I don't know if any of you heard of the prorogation case in 2019 when the court held that it was unlawful for the government to suspend parliament. Um, next click, please. So before moving on to the topic I'm going to talk about today, I'd just like to open it up and ask some of you, um, what, what do you think about when you hear the word constitution? What's the first thing that comes to mind? I can start you off. It can be as simple as a document, a written text. Any ideas? Um, is it something that like all the laws in the country have to kind of abide by? So it's kind of the, it's like a written text that basically is like a, um, a layer or like a beginning slate for everything else like pile up on. So everything has to abide by and kind of align with it. Yes, that's a great answer. Yeah, it's typically formed after some sort of revolution or big event, and as you say, like a starting point, and it sets out all the things that other laws have to follow. Yeah. Any other ideas? Maybe in relation to the rights that it gives you? key rights. Maybe you've heard in America, you know, in relation to gun control, people say, well, in the constitution, it says that I can bear arms. And... Maybe it's a book where different laws and rules are written 
in order to follow them. Yes, yeah, that's true. Okay, so now if we move on to the next slide, we'll get on to the, the main topic today. We're going to be looking at written versus unwritten constitutions. So a written constitution, uh, most countries have these, and we're gonna use the US as an example. So as some of you have said from your answers, a written constitution is when most of the rules for governance are contained in one sort of written document. And it sets out the relationships between the citizen and the state and between the different branches. So in the US, you have the Senate, the court and the president, and it sets out the framework about how these institutions are gonna interact with each other, how they're going to balance each other out, because obviously there's some actions that the president can't take without backing from Congress. Um, it also contains provisions for amendments. If we have a, a document, we wanna change it, right? We wanna update it. It can't be the same from 1700 to 2021. And uh, as you said in, in one of your answers, it's, it's known as supreme law. It takes priority over any conflicting state law. The constitution is the primary document. So that's a brief outline of, of the US situation. And now over to the UK. The UK has what's described by some people as an unwritten constitution. But this technically isn't true. I've, I've used written and unwritten for simplicity, but technically the UK constitution is written, it's just uncodified. Well, what does uncodified mean? It means that the different documents that make up the UK constitution have not been collated or compiled into one document like in the US situation. There's various documents spread over all over the place really that make up the UK constitution. So some examples, um, laws that parliament passes, some, some of those statutes are really important. Um, so um, statutes in relation to the different regions of the UK, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, the Human Rights Act about the rights that we have as citizens, um, European Union legislation that governed our relationships with the European Union. There's also key cases that are decided by the courts and some of those are given constitutional status. There's also something called conventions, which governs how the actors interact with each other, but they're based on tradition and history and practice rather than written in a, in a solid, in a single document. So having given that brief outline of written and unwritten, or as we now know, uncodified constitutions, we're going to have a debate about the advantages and disadvantages of these types of constitutions. So opening it up again, what do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of written and unwritten constitutions? Could, um, in unwritten constitutions, because there are so many, could maybe they kind of like juxtapose each other and so oppose each other, which can cause a bit of confusion. So something in one place that could be constitutional could be unconstitutional in another place, which can make things very confusing and make it harder to make decisions because you need to choose which one to overrule um, based on the situation and how important it is, I guess. Exactly right, yeah. So you're saying there could be two provisions that conflict and what do you do? They're in separate places. It's not as clear as it would be in, in a written constitution. Any other ideas? What would be a good thing about having a written document, one clear document that lays out all the rights, all the amendments, everything in one place? It would be easily accessible and like clearer to understand compared to an unwritten constitution. Yep, that's a great answer. Yes, definitely clearer, definitely easier for the citizen to access. You can sort of Google it and type it in and it's all in one place. And well, what would you say are the disadvantages of a written constitution? If it's sort of fixed in a written document? Some of the laws in the written constitution could be outdated and, you know, can't change them. Yes, that's, that's brilliant. Yes, obviously it's harder to change if it's in a written constitution. There is a room for amendments, but it's, it's harder to do than if it's unwritten. So now turning to the unwritten, what would you say are the disadvantages? It's sort of the, the inverse of what you said for the written one. Unwritten one is more open to interpretation. Ray, can you increase your volume, please? I don't know what's wrong with the um, arrangements of this. An unwritten constitution, an unwritten constitution would be more open to interpretation, meaning a lawyer could manipulate the law more easily. Okay, yes, yeah, so you're saying because it's less clear, there's more room for sort of abuse, potentially. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And any advantages to an unwritten one? Maybe what you were saying before about it's easier to amend, so therefore perhaps more flexible? Yeah, it's flexible. Yeah, that's great. So I think you've all identified the, the key points. What I had here in my notes, the advantages for a written one, it's clear, it's in one document, easy to access, easy for citizens to, come, to become aware of their rights and how they're governed, but it's harder to change. The amendment process is a lot harder. There's a series of checks you have to go through and also it imposes the ideals of the 1700s when the constitution was written sort of into today uh, in terms of an unwritten constitution it can be unclear it's not streamlined it can be difficult to access there's a transparency issue but it is more flexible more responsive and so you can sort of change it to fit the modern times next slide please so now I'm going to briefly talk to you about the careers that are available within law and constitutional law in particular. So the first image here you should see down the bottom, it's a barrister and it's, uh, it's meant to be a solicitor, it's not exactly clear. But uh, you can go into practice with your law degree, that's a sort of key area that people focus on. Um, you can practice public law at the bar if, if you like public speaking, if you like the idea of performing, if you like the idea of being in a courtroom all day and fighting for your client. Uh, conversely, if you'd like to go the solicitor route, you'd be in your office quite a lot, dealing with a lot of paperwork, uh, dealing closely with your client. Um, also, academia, public law really lends itself, or constitutional law lends itself really well to academia, teaching in various universities, writing papers, teaching students. But there's also other careers, as I said in the beginning, law is, really lends itself to other sectors and other professions, and it's looked on favourably and there's a lot of transferable skills. There's one example here on the, on the diagram, the Public Law Project. It's sort of a think tank involved with legal issues. So you can get involved in research, uh, civil service, politics. There's a lot of crossovers between law and, and other fields. All I have to say really. So I just wondered now if you had any questions. Um, what kind of um, essay subjects would you recommend doing if you wanted to study law and would you recommend definitely doing this or could you study like like not as much essay based subjects and still get into like a law degree at a very high level university? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of students that oh, I know have done... Oh, sorry. Can you sorry. still hear me? Naomi, you're... you've gone mute. Naomi. Oh dear. Okay, carry on. Sorry, Grace. Sorry. Sorry Grace. Carry on. Um, as I was saying, a lot of students that I know that have studied law have studied essay-based subjects at A-level, such as English and history, but it's by no means exclusive to those subjects. I wouldn't worry about, oh, I have to do those sort of subjects if I want to get onto a good law program at university. As I said in the opening stage of the presentation, I knew people who'd done biology, maths and chemistry. And there were transferable skills there, numerical skills for contract law, maybe, or the sort of analytical skills when you're looking over research findings from an experiment. So it's by no, no means ex exclusive to those sort of essay based subjects. But certainly doing something like English or history does help. It helps with good writing skills, with looking over source material, with the amount of reading that you'll have to do on a law degree. So I, my main sort of advice for A-levels would be to do the subjects that suit you, that you do well in, that you enjoy. And if you enjoy them and do well in them, you should get a place to do law. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. 